What's up, Bug Dini in the garage? I've heard your requests. Today, we are finally going to tackle the complete unabridged history of the Jeep Wrangler. As usual with these history videos, they will be heavily editorialized by me. You are welcome. Without further ado, let's get into it. This is the Jeep Wrangler. Even the most remote areas of the country can now be reached at the following number. The YJ was formally announced at the 1986 Detroit Auto Show and was immediately met with a large amount of animosity because the YJ, the Wrangler, coming onto the scene signaled the end of the long-running CJ nameplate arguably the nameplate that made Jeep's identity what it is. And CJ guys were basically convinced that this slightly wider, slightly lower to the ground, what they viewed as a watered down version of their CJ was basically gonna destroy uh, the image of the Jeep brand. Uh, that's something I like to call the Wrangler effect. Every time a new Wrangler is coming out, the old guard, the lovers of the previous generation are convinced the new one's gonna ruin the whole image of the Jeep brand. And then that Wrangler's around for 10 years. It endears itself to everybody and then we start over. The YJ was going to destroy what the CJs had built, and the TJ was going to destroy what the YJs had built, and then everybody fell in love with the TJ, and you see it goes on and on and on. So, uh, essentially, the YJ is actually not that much different than the CJ. Uh, visually, the front end's completely different. You got the rectangular headlights from the XJ, a totally different grill. The proportions are very much the same. In fact, you can actually take a YJ body, put it on a CJ frame, uh, and vice versa, with very little modifications. The big differences come in the on-road handling and safety aspects. You keep the leaf spring suspension front and rear from the CJ. The leaf springs get significantly wider. This is to improve uh, on-road stability and handling in general manners. Additionally, you get uh, track bars and sway bars. Uh, the engine choices are different than the CJ. You've got the 2.5 liter I4 uh, in the early years until 1990. You've got the 4.2 liter AMC straight six, and then you've got the Chrysler straight six, the almighty four liter from 1990 on, though the standard engine was the 2.5 liter, so a lot of the YJs you find are four bangers. Uh, five speed standard transmissions were standard uh, automatics you had to option up to. There weren't a ton of frills in the early YJs. Um, they all came with the same transfer case options in 1987. You're looking at the 207 that they quickly switched over in 1988 for the rest of its run to the 231. That's the command track that you've got in your XJ. You've got it in some ZJs. They put it in Dodge Durangos, not Dodge Durangos, Dodge Dakotas. Uh, it's a very popular transfer. Christmas amateur hour. It's a very popular transfer case, very capable and very strong, and it's one of the things that helped the YJ quickly build a reputation. These are crazy, um, capable little vehicles, and don't don't make any mistake, they are in fact little. The interesting thing about the YJ is it's the only Wrangler that doesn't have a dedicated off-road performance package. It's got a number of trim levels and a number of special additions, but none of them are like the Rubicon, which we're gonna talk about later, or the Moab. None of them increase the off-road capability. So with the YJ, what you have is a great platform. They didn't really give you any factory upgrades, they're not many. As far as trim levels, you've got an SE, a Sport, a Laredo, and a Sahara. Those, um, each of them gets a little bit more luxurious, adding things like power doors, uh, AC, different radio options. But for the most part, your different trim levels are gonna be different, uh, different rims, different decals. You do have the Islander, which has a really cool appearance package. You do have the Sahara, which was immortalized in uh, the first Jurassic Park movie. The Wrangler in Jurassic Park is a 1992 YJ Sahara, uh, one of the coolest Jeeps of all time and probably the most famous movie car outside of maybe like the General Lee. I don't know. Let's talk about that one down in the comments. What do you think is the most famous movie car? I'm going with the Sahara from Jurassic Park, at least for me anyway. Something that a lot of people do not realize is that the YJ actually had a long wheelbase model. When I talk about long wheelbase Wranglers, you think about the four-door Unlimiteds we have today, and you think about the TJ Unlimited, but there was actually a YJL. It's a long wheelbase YJ. The reason you don't know about it is because it was built in Egypt for Egypt 
only. None of them made it here to the United States. There are very few pictures of any, but if you go on the forums, you can talk about people uh, who had them uh, over in Egypt or have been over in the Middle East and have seen them. Super cool. I don't understand why we didn't get them. It looks very much like a CJ8 Scrambler with a top on, and I think it would have sold well here in the United States. The only thing I can assume, maybe Chrysler was afraid of cannibalizing Comanche and Dakota sales. That doesn't really track, but uh, two-door SUVs, I am always on board for the bigger the better looking at you ram charger but we're not talking about ram chargers we are here to talk about wranglers fun fact about the yj there is no model year 1996 for the wrangler you can get a 1995 or you can get a 1997 you could buy a wrangler in 1996 but it was not a model year 1996 here's what it was it was a bit of marketeering a little behind the scenes trickery chrysler had the tj teed up for model year 1997 they said hey how about we just don't make a Wrangler in 1996? We can sell off all our old 90, 95s, clear out our stock, and we can sell early release models of the 97 um, at premium price. And that's exactly what they did. The dealer would say, hey man, I can cut you a deal on this leftover 95 or, come here, uh, I can make you a great deal on next year's model. Yeah. Uh, so that's what they did. And they sold a ton of them. It worked like gangbusters. I think they sold 50,000 more Wranglers in 1996 than they had in 1995 uh, because of the, this whole marketeering thing. Uh, moving on now from the YJ to the TJ. Introducing the all new award winning Jeep Wrangler, the latest 4x4 of the year. Now, development on the TJ actually began in 1990. It was unveiled at the 1996 auto show, like I said, for the 1997 model year. There were some major changes, but for the most part, this is a refresh of the TJ. If you look at a TJ and a YJ side by side, you're not paying attention to the grill, the proportions and the silhouette are very similar. And in fact, they're also very similar to the CJ7. You line up a CJ7, a YJ and a TJ, Unless you're a Jeep guy, you're gonna have a pretty hard time figuring out which one came first. The major difference is in the suspension. They got rid of all of the leaf springs and instead took the suspension from the ZJ Grand Cherokee of the time and gave it four corner coil springs. This drastically changed the driving experience. Um, most would agree for the better. I think the only people who would argue are YJ guys. YJ guys are so funny, man. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've heard YJ guys say, if it doesn't have square headlights, it's not a Wrangler. <laughs> Looking at you, Dave Random. Uh, I love Wrangler guys, man. You guys are the best. As far as the interior on the TJ, it shares a lot of styling cues with the 1996 updated XJ. If you look at a uh, refreshed XJ from 96 to 01 and you look at the interior of a TJ, the center stack, the radio bezels, a lot of the interior design elements are the same, just a parts bin situation. Another major change for the TJ, at least major change for Jeep guys, we bring back the round headlights. That's the major, if you're trying to figure out if something is a YJ or a TJ the two things to look for are what shape are the headlights and are the windshield wipers on the windshield or sitting down by the cow YJ has square rectangular headlights and the um, windshield wipers are actually sitting on the glass whereas a TJ has round headlights there are other ways to tell but as far as engine options you get the four liter all years which is a beautiful thing the 2.5 is still standard until 02 when they switch to the 2.4 power tech that's from your liberty that's from your pt cruiser and i think they were putting it in some uh minivans all you can say about the 2.5 and the 2.4 is that they're they're engines that go. They don't go particularly quick, but they will last a long time and they will get you from point A to point B. You put gas in them, you put oil in them, and they will go. And at the end of the day, what more could you want from an engine? Uh, but of course, the real story about the TJs, you get the four liter all years. That's a beautiful thing. Standard transmissions are still standard in the TJ. If you want an automatic, you have to option up. All right, now in 2003, there was a pretty notable change. It's, it, it's an upgrade. It's not really a facelift. They they modernized the TJ. If you look at a TJ from 97 to 02, it's in, and you sit in it and you look at it and you say, this is a 90s vehicle. If you sit in one from 03 to 06, you say, this is an early 2000s vehicle. Subtle changes. The radio bezels go from square edges to rounded edges. The seats get a little bit of a refresh in shape. The uh, side view mirrors get a refresh in shape. The colors that are available change. Just a subtle shift to update it so that it stays relevant through its production run. Now, so another thing the TJ did that's a very Wrangler 
thing. They just went absolute gangbusters with the special editions and the trim levels. Uh, the, the JK, the Wrangler that comes next, kind of standardizes trim levels. TJ is all over the map. You've got your SE, which is your entry level. Then you've got your X, which is your mid entry level. Essentially now the four liter is standard, but you cannot option in a Dana 44 until you move to the Sport, which is the exact same as the SE and the X, except the Dana 44 can be optioned in. It's not standard, but you can option in a Dana 44 with track lock and the four liter is um, standard. If you ask me, <laughs> why have all three of those should have just been the sport with the 2.5 standard and, and you can option in the four liter if you want to, but that's not how they chose to do it. As far as special editions, you've got your unlimited Sahara and Rubicon, which we are definitely going to talk about those three in a minute. Additionally, you've got your Apex, your Freedom, your Columbia, your Golden Eagle, Rocky Mountain, Tomb Raider, and Willys. None of these really change the way mustard tastes all that much. They're essentially appearance packages, different rims, different color rims, different accents, color options, decals the three that really make a difference your Sahara which at this point it's the beginning of it being your luxury model if you're gonna get heated seats um, you know seven speaker infinity system stuff like that that's gonna be in your Sahara Rubicon's introduced in 2002 obviously named after the Sierra Nevada mountains it comes with airlocked Dana 44 in the rear rock track 4x4 which is the 241 transfer case with uh, 4 to 1 low gearing that's your crawler gear you get diamond plated rockers and an NV 3555 speed transmission standard that is a beefy transmission a beefy transfer case uh, these are just Oh, so cool. The original Rubicons are by far my favorite. Uh, Rubicon from here on out is going to be your off-road performance package. And in hindsight, it's really weird that the YJ didn't have a Rubicon type package, right? Like something that maybe came with a lift or came with different things. But uh, from here on out, you're going to have a Rubicon. And then the one we need to talk about, the Unlimited. In 2004, Jeep gave us the long wheelbase TJ Unlimited. From here on out, Unlimited is going to mean a long wheelbase uh, Jeep. It is 10 inches longer in the wheelbase, which gives it a 103.5 inch wheelbase. This is identical to the CJ6 and the CJ8 Scrambler, which is why when you look at a TJ Unlimited, it just hits different because the proportions say 1970s, 1980s Jeep. The, the CJ6, the Scrambler, Ronald Reagan standing there next to a CJ6. Um, the proportions are absolutely perfect. It is still a two-door. This is not the four-door unlimited yet. With that 10 inch longer wheelbase, you get 15 inches total overall length, more than a standard TJ. That's two inches of legroom and 13 inches of cargo space. It almost doubles the cargo space, but even more important, because the Wrangler is body on frame, by increasing the wheelbase, what you do is you give it a much higher tow capacity. A standard TJ with the four liter can tow about 2,000 pounds, manufacturer recommended. The TJ Unlimited is rated for 3,500 pounds. That's a lot more. That's significant. That goes from towing a small boat to towing just about what you want to with, with a Wrangler. Now, while the TJ Unlimited from 2004 to 2006 is an absolute thing of beauty, in 2005, we marry the two best things about the TJ. The TJ Unlimited gets a Rubicon edition. The 2005 and 2006 TJ Unlimited Rubicon is my favorite Jeep of all time. I have a buddy who has a pristine one. I mean, it is just, it's so good looking. It's got the diamond plate um, rockers. It's got the skid plates, the bumpers from the Rubicon. Uh, it came in just the best colors. It is, in my opinion, it's just the perfect Jeep. Um, absolutely love them. You get those from 05 to 06. In 06, the TJ goes away completely. An interesting thing about the TJ, it's kind of a, a sad thing. The TJ is the last vehicle to use any AMC sourced parts. In 2006, it marks the true death of, well, two amazing things. The true, true death. The last vestiges of AMC are gone with the TJ, and the TJ is the last vehicle to use the beloved four liter. Moment of silence for the four liter. Moving on, uh, when the JK comes in in 2007, it is an 
utter and complete ground up rebuild. Uh, one last thing about the TJ. With the TJ Unlimited, I always thought it was weird that they didn't give it a scrambler package. Take out the back seat and give it like a tub, you know what I mean? Um, you got those little woody sides or something. I, I think that was a missed opportunity, but there's a company called AEV that noticed the missed opportunity and said, I got that. <laughs> so what you can actually do, it's called the Brute Conversion, B-R-U-T-E from A-V-E. You literally chop the back of your TJ off and you replace it with a this flat rear window that would be right here like a pickup truck like a single cab with a bed um an interesting thing if you know matt from bleep and jeep i haven't watched him in a while but i know in his old shop he had the back end the butt end of a tj just sitting up against the wall right he got that from somebody who did a brute conversion so if you've seen that that's literally you chop the back of your truck off from like right here uh and you, you put this brute conversion on so it's a pretty intense thing um but dang, do they look good, man. A brute converted. Now, here's the thing, though. I don't think I can advocate chopping up um, a, an unlimited Rubicon. That is a, uh, a beautiful wildflower that, that should not be picked. That's a terrible analogy. <laughs> what was I trying to say? I don't know. Something rare that you shouldn't screw with. Moving on to the JK. The world's first four-door, five-passenger Wrangler. Wrangler Unlimited, a new species from Jeep. Now development on the JK, the next generation Wrangler started in 2001 and we unknowingly got a sneak peek at this Wrangler in 2005 when Jeep released the Gladiator concept. Now that concept was for the Gladiator truck that we ended up getting last year. But if you look at that concept and you know what a JK looks like, they very clearly took what they were working on uh, for the JK and just put a bed on it and Put that out the door which i find very interesting now the jk is the first time the wrangler is split into a two-door and a four-door version now with the tj when we spoke about the unlimited it was long wheelbase but it was still two-door from here on out when you talk about a wrangler unlimited it's a four-door wrangler if it's just a jk it's two-door so jk two-door jku jk unlimited four-door you get it the jk was released at the detroit international auto show in 2006 in a way uh that is just oh so jeep they took the jk they drove it up the steps of cobo hall in detroit and through a plate glass window anybody who saw my history on the grand cherokee knows this is not the first time jeep has unveiled a vehicle like this in 1992 14 years beforehand they had taken the brand new zj and I think it was Bob Lutz, drove it up the steps of Cobalt Hall through a plate glass window. If you haven't seen that video, I highly recommend you go check it out because Grand Cherokees are awesome and amazing, and so is my history video on them. Uh, the JKU, the unlimited version, was released at the New York International Auto Show that same year, 2006, though sadly they didn't drive it through anything. I'm a little disappointed to hear about that. As far as the JK and the JKU, they're identical, with the unlimited being 20 inches longer and obviously having uh, four doors. But other than that, they are pretty much identical. The trim levels track out. The parts pretty much all match up. Uh, they are the same Jeeps for all intents and purposes, though they were a complete redesign from the TJ ground up they're about three and a half inches wider two inches longer wheelbase but two inches shorter overall which is why the JK was very hard to take when it came out all right the CJ to the YJ as much as we complained they, they looked the same the silhouette remember I talked about the silhouettes before if you line up a, y, a CJ a YJ a TJ and then a JK and you're just looking at the silhouette CJ uh, JK is going to stick out like a sore thumb because for the first time they've really changed the proportions wheelbase is longer but overall is shorter and it's wider it doesn't look like the same vehicle anymore so other than being made in Toledo Ohio and being called a Wrangler there are very 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 few similarities that enthusiasts could draw between the YJ or TJ and the JK. To this end, the main goal in updating the TJ to the JK was to improve safety. That's always been a concern with the Wrangler. People are convinced that they're a super unsafe vehicle. And so to combat that, Jeep has had to always try to be ahead of the curve. The JK gets stability control, anti-lock brakes, and traction control. Uh, additionally, this is the first time you can get a two-wheel drive Wrangler. All YJs were four-wheel drive with the 231 or the 207 transfer case. A couple 
Mobile TJs were two-wheel drive, but only the ones that were sold to the USPS. Postal workers in rural areas could buy a right-hand drive, two-wheel drive TJ, but the public could not have them. Starting in 2007, they said, sure, we'll sell you a two-wheel drive Wrangler. Uh, I don't think it sold very well because it only uh, survived until 2010, which makes sense. Now, listen, folks. One time I saw a two-wheel drive WJ in the junkyard and I call it the dumbest thing I'd ever seen. And a couple people ripped me apart for that one, specifically people that lived in Florida, Texas, the Carolinas, and I guess I get it. If you live in Miami Beach and you want a WJ, maybe you don't need the four-wheel drive. I still think, why are you buying a Jeep if you don't want four-wheel drive? But if you're gonna buy a Wrangler, I don't care where you live, Miami Beach or Alaska, you buy it in four-wheel drive. I'm putting my foot down, we're settling this issue now. Wranglers are four-wheel drive. Jeeps seem to know that because they did away with that in uh, 2010. Now, engine options. From 2007 to 2011, uh, the JK got the 2.8 liter uh, V6 that they were putting in minivans at the time. I actually did a video on why Grand Cherokees of that time got the 3.7, but Wranglers of the exact same time got the 3.8. And we did a little bit of fuzzy math and we did some speculation, but with the help of the comments section, I think we figured out an answer. So if you're interested in that, I'll try to remember to put a link up in the corner if you're watching this and there's no link somebody leave me a comment down in the squawk box and say hey idiot go put your link in there uh, it, that's a decent motor it's a decent motor but if you're going to get a jk i highly recommend you hold out for a 2012 to 2018 when he got the pentastar the pentastar is a 3.6 liter v6 pushing 280 horsepower it's just a superior motor it's nothing against the 3.8 uh, it's I just we actually just bought one we uh, traded in the wife's compass bought a Durango Oh my god, that was the best decision we have ever had and it's got a Pentastar and I cannot believe how well that 3.6 moves that pretty big SUV uh, relatively anyway uh, How well it moves that around while still being wildly efficient. My mother has one in a WK2 Same thing the Pentastar is a great motor in addition to that allegedly uh, the RA428 Diesel was available in the Wranglers though I say allegedly because certainly none of them made it here in Jersey. I've never seen one I think all those ended up either in Canada uh, or out there in Europe, but you could get a diesel Wrangler until 2015 when they did away with that motor uh, because they were starting to work on the eco diesel which we're going to talk about in a minute on the jl now in 2009 and 2010 they did a couple of upgrades to the jk and the jku they added uh hill start they added trailer sway control which if i understand properly manipulates the traction control if it feels your trailer starting to affect the way your jeep is moving uh personally i feel like you can just learn how to drive a trailer uh i'm gonna go on a little rant here i think it's a dying art trailer backing up right uh old timers back me up here right they got the cameras now i think the fords will just park the darn thing for you i don't think that's good man mark my words if we lose the ability to back up trailers without assist society will crumble rant over moving on uh additionally it came with uconnect now which is a, the new uh mopar uh infotainment system uh as well as apparently an easier folding soft top and bigger sun visors apparently the original jk sun visor didn't do daily squat to keep the sun's rays at your uh eyes there so they gave them better ones now what i really love about the jk is it make it has trim levels that make sense and it makes it clear and concise so you can look at a wrangler and know what you're looking at you got your sport that is your absolute base model hand crank windows no ac cloth seats absolute bare bones i wanted a wrangler i don't want to pay a lot for it then you have your xs or in 2009 it became your sport x this is what most of them were all right you got ac fog lights cruise control a couple other things are standard and then if you want you can option in a few more things most wranglers jk's jku's that you see are the sport x you got your sahara after that which from here on out is firmly your luxury model leather seats seven speaker infinity audio um, you know, power this, power that. That's your luxury model. Then the Rubicon again comes back, uh, this time with 32 inch BFG KM tires, front and rear Dana 44s with an e locker, electronic sway bar disconnects, which I think is just autumn. I'm not a fan, obviously, you can tell from my trailer rant of most nanny systems and, and extra bits of technology in new cars but electronic sway bar link disconnects are pretty cool in my book uh, additionally the rubicon continues on with the 241 rock track 4x4 system and 410 gearing it's basically uh it's an animal for if you want a factory off-roader at this time you either had to buy an fj cruiser but who hates themselves enough for that or 
you get the Rubicon. As far as special editions, the JK does not disappoint, just like its predecessor. It's got a whole host of them. Some of them make sense, some of them make no friggin' sense, but uh, they're all basically appearance packages. Outside of the Rubicon, a couple other ones we're gonna talk about. You get bigger tires, different rims, uh, different decals, maybe other different things, but none of them actually affect the performance of the vehicle. You're looking at your Rocky Mountain, your Islander, your regular mountain, your 70th anniversary. Listen, Jeep, we don't need to celebrate every five years. I get it that your whole brand is your heritage, but enough. You had the 60th, the 65th, the 70th, you get 50, you get 75, and then we'll celebrate in 100. We're not doing this every five years, okay? Rant over. After that, you have your Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, which as someone who doesn't play video games, that one goes square over my head, but it's actually pretty cool. They sent this thing to AEV, that company that did the brute conversion for the TJ. It got custom hood, custom bumpers, basically custom everything, obviously custom decals. The thing does look mean, uh, and it's based on a Rubicon, so it's all already got that level of um, performance built in. I don't, I don't know why I call it duty. I don't get it. Is there a Miss Pac-Man version? Something moving on. Uh, you got your Moab, you got your Overland, which is an Australia only option. Basically, they took a Sahara and they dialed the luxury up to 11, which I think is very cool. I don't understand why only Australia got it. Maybe because, no, I don't know. Then you got crazy versions like the Dragon, the Polar, the Freedom, uh, the Golden Eagle, which was only a 2018. It was kind of a send-off model. And then the Rubicon X, which is a even beefier version of the Rubicon. Custom bumpers, custom hood, custom wheels, custom everything, because why not? Now there are a few other uh, interesting modifications that can be done to the JK that I'm not sure a ton of people know about. First of all, in 2011, uh, Mopar put out the JK8 conversion. That takes the two-door Wrangler, it chops the back off. It's basically a brute conversion, like what AEV did for the TJ. So you can have a two-door single cab pickup based on a JK. Not to be outdone, in 2012, AEV put out out what they call the double cab brute conversion. You can figure out what that is. Instead of being based on the two-door, it's based on the four-door JKU. They lob the back little bit off, they slam a uh, truck bed on it, and basically in 2012, AEV made the 2019 Gladiator. It looks just like it. It's just based on the, the JK instead of the JL. And then the ultimate in JK, JKU is the J8. All right, now Jeep has always had an association with military use because of its origin, right? And as such, the whoever owned the Jeep brand has always tried to make special versions of their vehicles for um, military use. Uh, the M38A1 is based off the CJ5, uh, various other ones. Uh, you see XJs have been used for a number of different military uses. Not always the US military, but some foreign militaries. Now the J8 is a Chrysler project based on the JKU. It is about as heavily modified as anything can be, and it just looks absolutely mean. They took a JKU. It's based on the four-door. You can either have it as a four-door SUV, or they do a two-door uh, it's kind of a pickup scrambler looking thing, but still based on the four door. You get larger brakes, axles, and a totally beefed up suspension. They got a rid of the, got a wid. My, <coughs> my goodness, amateur hour. They got rid of the rear coil springs, replaced them with uh, leaf springs so that this thing can actually tow 770 pounds, which is a whole lot for a JKU. It gets a 2.8 liter diesel standard. It's got a standard snorkel. It's manufactured in Egypt, again, like the LJ or YJL, uh, and it's only for foreign military use. The reason you never see them here is because they will not pass US emissions, which is confusing to me because I was told we're the biggest defender of emissions and yet whatever. Uh, the J8 is so friggin' cool looking. Obviously, you can configure it however you need to. All passengers, various artillery uh, mounting points and stuff, just absolutely 10 out of 10 cool. I love to see that Jeeps are still being used for military use. To my knowledge, the US military does not use them. I could be wrong. I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one on TV. 2018, the JK and JKU go away. Basically, really only because of 
they needed to be updated for safety and technology. The JK and the JKU are immensely popular. Now, I said in the beginning that they were kind of a bitter pill for Wrangler fans to swallow. It was hard to see the shape and proportions of what you know as a Jeep and a, and a Wrangler change. It was super hard to swallow a four-door Wrangler. Around this time, when these came out, I was campaigning against four-door Chargers and I was campaigning against four-door Wranglers. These two things were abhorrent to me, but the reality of the situation is the the success of the JK is because of the JKU. Suddenly people who would love to daily a Wrangler but couldn't do without a full back seat and four doors, they have that option. Soccer moms, who drives JKs more or JKUs more than soccer moms, right? Families, it's a family vehicle now. It went from being an enthusiast car, something maybe you drove on the weekends when you didn't have the kids or people to take to the minivan. The JKU replaced the friggin' minivan and that is awesome uh this thing sold like crazy yes chrysler had to file for bankruptcy during the jk's run but it was not because of the jk it's not because of jeep at all it's because of chrysler i'm pretty sure those people just don't know how accounting works uh talk to someone over at ford they never see seem to have a bailout gm and chrysler go study with ford whatever the point being uh jeep is always the thing that is selling the best no matter who's owning it and the wrangler is always selling the best out of all the jeeps and the jk and the jku are absolute poster children for this uh, i think that's one of the reasons there's so many crazy special editions because they were like screw it these people will buy anything we put out there as long as it says wrangler on it right now uh and in fact it survived a very difficult time for bigger less efficient suvs like look at the fj cruiser fj cruiser didn't survive during this time period a bunch of other suvs were being killed off off as gas guzzlers and the jk and the jku were such good such appealing vehicles that they survived during the recession that was a very difficult time i mean people were selling everything to go buy priuses you know uh, but in 2018 they get rid of it really not because it was unpopular or it was just a little bit outdated in the safety and technology areas that's where the jl and the jail you come in from 2019 to present now like i said it was more of a refresh really the proportions are kind of the same allegedly jeep took cues for the interior and exterior from the original cj lines and you can kind of see that it's a very very modern very liberal take on classic jeep styling if you take off your skeptics glasses and you look at like the dash there are elements that are reminiscent of the old stamped steel dashes even the exterior the way the bumpers hang the way the grill it goes back to the raked grill from the tj which i think is a good thing because one of the things that was always a little jarring for me was the front of the jk i don't think it aged well i think it looked very 2007 which was fine in 2007 but even by like 2012 anyway we're still being built in uh, Toledo, Ohio. The new JK and JKU are two and a half and three and a half inches longer than their counterparts, though they're about 200 pounds lighter. And this is because they started making various components out of aluminum, like the windshield frame, the doors. Uh, additionally, they tried to make the Wrangler more user friendly. The doors have little handles in them for carrying them. The rear cargo area has a place to keep your windshield and your doors if you decide to take them off. It's also got, comes with a toolkit specifically for that. So one of the things Wrangler guys gripe about the most is zipping up your your soft top or taking your hard top off finding a place for your doors and they address this kind of stuff in addition to being user friendly you've got a host of engines we got the 36 pentastar standard that we already talked about you can get a two liter hurricane or a two liter uh, hurricane hybrid which i don't think are that popular in the u.s yet but they might be later you've got the three liter eco diesel listen guys chrysler kind of bet the farm on this they spent a ton of time and it spun up to amateur hour a ton of time and a ton of money developing this three liter eco diesel that's why they're cramming it in so much the gladiator the jl the 1500 uh so go buy it do chrysler a favor um it's it's actually a really good diesel from what i hear now addition to those engines they are also satisfying both bitter edges of the spectrum you've got the uh jl 4xe which is a plug-in electric vehicle uh, to satisfy that particular niche. All I'm gonna say about that, I have nothing against electric vehicles, but there's no vehicle on the planet that I want to be electric less than a Wrangler. 
Maybe that's the point. I don't know. I'll leave a link to a, a video we did when they announced it. Uh, that's I did my best to be unbiased. I know I, I hate on electric vehicles, but that one was really just the facts. It was after Jeep released the video for the 4xe. Then on the other spectrum, my end of the spectrum, they finally announced for the first time ever, the Wrangler is getting a street performance package. It's gonna be called the Rubicon 392. It's getting the 6.4 liter Heme. That thing's got a Heme. I just couldn't be more excited. Uh, this again is definitely a response to the Bronco. The Bronco had the benefit of copying the Wrangler and then just filling in whatever the Wrangler was lacking, which is why there are so many features cram packed into the Bronco. The Wrangler has owned, literally owned that whole segment since the other Bronco went away, since the FJ Cruiser went away. What competes with the Wrangler? Anyway, uh, Jeep realized that and they said, we got to do something and said, hey, don't we have any more of those Hemis lying around? So for the first time ever, the Wrangler's getting a street performance package. Now with that, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a hundred grand or 75 grand or something, but uh, you're going to get about 470 horses and 470 torques. And that is just fine by me. Now, as far as special editions and trim levels, they kept a lot of the same trim levels. You're starting out with your Sport and then you've got your Sport S, which is the same idea. Like Sport is just bare bones. I'm pretty sure an, a JL Sport still Still has crank down windows. Could you imagine buying a twenty and, and no AC? Could you imagine buying a 2021 new vehicle and it has crank down windows? I don't. I'm sure maybe some Korean rickshaw company or something's doing it, but um, that's mind boggling to me. I think most people are going to opt for the Sport S, which, as we talked about, standard power doors, standard AC, but no other frills. Uh, and then you've got your Sport Altitude. Now, if I hadn't had an experience of shopping on a use on a Jeep car lot recently, I wouldn't fully understand what the altitude is. What altitude means in Jeep language is it's going to cost more, but you don't really know why. Altitude is like it, it's the ultimate appearance package. They just they just change one feature and they make it so that feature is only available on the altitude. For instance, uh, we were looking at when we bought our compass. Um, my, we found one that had black wheels. It was an altitude. Apparently, you can only get black wheels on a compass if you get the altitude. It costs several thousand dollars more, uh, and I have a can of um, Plasti Dip, so you know we opted for the, the latitude. But uh, and I saw that across the board. So they sell the Sahara, which is your luxury model, and then the Sahara Altitude, which is your luxury model, but with like black gauges. Um, I'm not a fan of the altitude if, if you couldn't figure that out but uh if, if it has a feature that you absolutely have to have and you feel like paying three grand more for it go for it then you got your rubicon this time with 33 inch tires but everything else is pretty much the same rock track uh 241 electronic sway bar disconnects hydraulic rebound stop shocks which if i understand properly really just improve the suspension characteristics both on road and off road and then there's one tier above the rubicon it's the moab which i think is really cool even though i'd never be able to afford it uh it basically takes all the luxury of the sahara and the capability of the rubicon and it puts them together makes sense surprise no one ever thought about it uh earlier um and then really the only other thing to talk about here, since the JL is so new, we don't have a ton of info on it, is the Gladiator. It's obviously based on a JL and a JLU. And in doing the research for this video, I fell in love with the Gladiator to the point where I might actually own one. I used to say about the Gladiator, I like that it exists, but it's not for me. I don't know that that's true anymore. Now, the Gladiator seems to be just a JLU with a bed on the back. It's a, what they call it? A double cab brute, like from the JK, right? Not so. Let's let's dig into the Gladiator just a bit. It's it is based on the JL, but it's not or JLU, but it's firmly competing with other pickup trucks. What's it competing with? The Canyon, Toyota Tacoma, Ford Ranger. Uh, I don't know if Nissan still makes the Xterra, but if it is, they do. It is that. Yet it's the only one in that lineup that has convertible roof, removable doors. That's a big get, right? Uh, it's also got pretty impressive statistics. Now a stock. Gladiator can tow about 4,000 pounds, which is in line with those other trucks, but you can option a Gladiator up to a 7,650 pound, 7,650 pound tow cap. That's a lot of tow cap for what is considered a small truck today. Now, what I didn't realize is they put considerations in to make it a better truck. 
it has wider front grille slats. You don't notice unless you have a JLU and, and, a, and a Gladiator right next to each other. This is to improve engine cooling. So you get one of these with that three liter eco diesel, you got a pretty serious truck on your hands. Now the bed is about as useless as the bed in any of these small trucks. Tacoma beds are useless, Canyon beds are useless, Gladiator beds are pretty much useless. Uh, but now you can tow a big old trailer with your 7600 tow cap. Uh, so Gladiator is a very cool vehicle. It's not the truck a lot of us wanted from Jeep, but it's the one that makes the most sense. And they look super cool with the roof and the doors off super cool so there we have it friends 34 years four generations plus a plug-in electric plus a spin-off truck a number of brute conversions and just a number of absolutely iconic vehicles from your 92 Saharas to your 06 TJ Unlimiteds to your Gladiators to your Rubicon X's. The Wrangler is one of the most iconic, probably the most iconic vehicle. I know somebody, some Ferrari guy or something's gonna argue with me on that, but screw you, man. Ferraris look like Lamborghinis. Wranglers don't look like anything else. Wrangler is a Wrangler is a Wrangler all day. I'd love to know what you thought about this video and I'd love to know about your Wrangler. Which ones have you owned? Which ones have you driven? Which ones do you love? What is your favorite? What is your all time? Hey, if you could only take three Wranglers on a desert island for the rest of your life, which three are you taking? Um, for me, 92 Sahara, uh, 06 TJ Unlimited, mm, Gladiator, does that count? I really did fall in love with the Gladiator, which anybody who watches me knows that's a little weird because I wasn't a fan. So leave me a comment down there in the squawk boxes. If you like the video, like the video. That's just common sense. Subscribe to the channel. Maybe even go check out our website, monkeywithatoolbox.com. As always, thanks for watching. 